Hi, and welcome to Hangout with the Buck Institute for Education. My name is Liam Baer, and I'm the new media coordinator at BIE. And tonight, we'll be discussing student stories, high quality work, and how they got there. I'm very lucky to be joined by John Larmer, the editor-in-chief at BIE, and author Todd Felton. Hi, guys. Hi, Liam. Tonight, we'll be looking at a driving question and that driving question is how can teachers and schools best tell the story behind a great project recently John Larmer wrote a post at the beginning of October about five that gave us five tips for getting high quality work John can you go through those tips for us uh, sure Liam uh, the basic uh, tips I want to make in that blog a couple weeks ago were um, one, it's important to give students um, an idea of what quality you expect. And it could be through a rubric, or it could be through a good set of exemplars or models of the kind of product students are going to create or the kind of thinking you want them to do. So that's one, uh, clarifying your, your, the criteria, you know, what good quality work looks like, what you expect. Um, another piece of the, of the puzzle is formative assessment to give kids lots of chance to revise their work with critique and, and feedback from the teacher and peers. Uh, also, the third tip would be, do students have enough time? Just plain old time to do good quality work. So many assignments in school are rushed for students, so building time into your projects for that process of revision and, and reflection is important. Um, and then uh, students will feel more motivated to do high quality work if it's authentic to them, if it means something to them, they care about it. So a good project should really engage students emotionally as well as intellectually and make them really want to do high quality work uh, for their audience, for themselves. And finally, uh, the school and classroom culture can promote high quality work by having just a sort of a, uh, the air in a school can, can say, we do high quality work here. The teachers talk about it, the, the students talk about what high quality work is, take pride in their work, post their work, show it to the public. Uh, that's a good way to promote quality throughout the school. So Todd will tell us some stories about projects and and the good work and what went into them to make them good. So, looking forward to it, Todd. Great. Hey, thanks so much. It's, it's so good to be back here um, on the Google Plus Hangout for BIE. And, um, yeah, last, last time I talked a lot about student stories and how uh, we can tell stories about... Uh, transformative learning experiences for students um, in an effort to sort of build a community support for for PBL and um, the work that our kids are doing and this this month I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper and talk about one specific type of story that that you can tell and that's the story that's behind high quality student work oftentimes we're looking at great great student work and we're deeply impressed, but what's really impressive is all the hard work uh, that went into that piece. And a lot of times we don't get to see that. So tonight we're going to talk about um, some, great, some great student projects and talk a little bit about the stories that happened uh, to lead up to that and how we might think about telling those stories for our schools. So first off, um, Liam, I think we have a, uh, a video from the Pearl Cone School in Nashville, Tennessee. So this is a, um, a music video that they put together. Uh, this is a 9 through 12 high school in Nashville. And I'm going to let you have a listen, and then I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit more about what's going on behind the scenes here. Why don't you hit play there, William? The rising sun of a new day, a new day begun. Let us march on, killing the reason. Let us march on. Yeah, 
So sing and help us sing songs of all culture. They help us come together. National language to love, so music is forever. As we march on, the victory is won. We still have a way to go, but yes, we still be good. Let's make the joyful noise and let's all sing. We came a long way, so let freedom ring. All right. That was just a, a small clip from from the whole uh, video, but uh, boy, it's the the whole thing is definitely worth worth watching. Um, and if your reaction's anything like mine when I first saw this, you're like, man, these kids are talented, and this must be a really amazing school and opportunity. Um, and you're totally right. It is these kids. Are talented. I had the good fortune to go down and visit this school in September and was just absolutely blown away by the passion and the the dedication the um, and just the sheer talent of kids walking around in the hallways. The school is actually the Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet School and uh, so you might be saying, oh, of course that's why they can do high-quality work. They're an entertainment magnet school. And what the, what the school is, is Nashville recently reorganized all of its high schools into academies, many of which are themed academies, and this is the entertainment-themed academy, the first such uh, entertainment magnet school in the country, in fact. But... Here's the story. Two years ago, this was a struggling urban inner city school. And yes, they've gotten some money th through the Magnet Grant, but they're still very much at the start of their PBL journey. They're still really learning how to put this project together. So this project, which was the culmination of a number of months of work, and involved the entire school was really the first such project that this school has ever done. So it becomes even the more impressive when you think about a school that's been struggling, has had a new principal sort of every year or two for a number of years. Only a fraction of the kids who are at the school have actually chosen it because of the entertainment magnet. Most are going to that school because it's the one in their neighborhood. It's the closest one that they can walk to. So it's not a school full of, um, you know, future glee performers. It's these are these are kids from the neighborhood who are coming to the school, and they worked on this project for months and months to put it together. And if you look, there's. Um, at some point, we'll put up the link. There's an accompanying video that's it's 28 minutes long, so we can't show it here. But it's a great look at the story behind it. And it sort of lays out all of the work that they did um, during, during the lead-up to this. So when you, when you delve into the story, when you delve into what's going on behind this video, you'll see that the song that they chose, the Black National Anthem, um, was actually written um, just a few blocks from their school. It was actually written in Nashville. So part of the reason that they chose this particular project was because it, it provided the rigor and the relevance to their daily lives. They, it was part of a Black History Month um, project that sort of grew and grew into their own take on an established uh, song written in their neighborhood. 
So it had it had the rigor of of research and uh, delving into Black History Month and the heritage. It had relevance because it it was a song that had been written nearby. It spoke to their experiences, and the, had the voice and choice of them putting their own spin on things. Some other benefits to the story are that because this was sort of the first thing this this school had done that really involved everybody, and after coming through a very difficult time, it did a tremendous amount to raise school pride. Going back to the idea of how it addresses quality, because there was enough time, as, as John mentioned, um, you need time to do high quality work. They gave themselves enough time for the kids to be shown what good quality works looks like, talk about what good quality and craftsmanship work looks like, and have the time to develop their pieces. So everyone who did a solo there had auditioned, had trained specifically one-on-one -on -one with their voice coach, had gone through rehearsals after rehearsals, laid down a number of tracks, and eventually the whole thing was, was put together. Um, one last piece that, that I want to talk about um, is that, that connection to community um, that is so much a part of driving, driving quality. And this was mentioned in the, um, the very first Google Hangout of this month when, when uh, John and Dana uh, were talking about sort of what are the ways to get at quality. And one, uh, John mentioned that public audience and having a, a, an authentic product to, to share helps inspire kids, helps push kids to do their very best. This was certainly the case. They knew that this video was going to go out public. They knew that, it, that they were going to be doing public performances of this song. So it really pushed them. In addition, the whole music program of which this is the, the first major product is um, a result of a community partnership with Warner Music. And so there was a whole bunch of community investment in both the students, this particular project, and the program itself. So all of those things gave these students, who had not had much to look forward to previously, something to really grab onto and run with. And so that's the story that's behind this great video. But if you only watch this great video, uh, you see a bunch of talented kids who are just knocking the song out of the ballpark, and they, you know, they should be on The Voice or uh, any of those other singing shows because they're just that good. So um, that's the story number one. We've got another story, but I wanted to pause a little moment um, and maybe talk, um, open it up if there are any questions um, that have come across the board yet, or, or maybe, John, you have some comments or questions? Uh, yeah, I've just got a quick question, um, and I thought, now in this case, of course, I can't imagine there was a rubric for a great song, but um, did the students know what, you know, really, I mean, I guess from watching great singers on The Voice or whatever, kids already had sort of a good exemplar of what, uh, what good singing is, but did they work with um, sort of experts along the way from the recording industry to give them sort of examples of what they were trying to shoot for? Excellent, excellent question because they actually did have um, a great model to work from. In your earlier um, comment you said you know you can work from either rubrics or exemplars. These guys studied the We, All, we Are the World oh, yeah. video from the, mm -hmm. from the 80s yeah. and that's obviously what they based their sort of presentation on, and they spent a long time breaking that down and talking about what made it work and why it was such high quality, what brought yeah. these singers together and sort of how they made all the pieces come together. So they had, they used an exemplar 
rather than a rubric to drive that that high quality work and give them that thing to aim for. Yeah. Oh, in answer to your second question, John, they were fortunate enough. They're fortunate enough to have um, a um, a couple of music industry folks both at the school and through the community partnership. So they had experts to work with them on what professional level singing is. Yeah. All right. Liam, any questions come in over the transom yet? Yeah, uh, we haven't had any questions yet, but if you do have any questions, please put them up on um, the Google Plus event page, and I'll have... JL or Todd answer them, but I really appreciate this because we used to sing the Black National Anthem, lift, lift Every Voice and Sing, every morning in our classroom when I was a teacher in Baltimore City public school system, and it really brought everybody together, so this new take on it is pretty incredible. Yeah, if, if, um, if folks can, can um, get that link, and we'll, we'll send the link out a after this is done, but... Um, watch the link for the whole song and then also the documentary is, is fascinating. It's good quality stuff. But I want to talk about a school, um, another school um, in, this school's in Portland, Maine. Uh, it's King Middle School. And they are particularly good at both creating projects and then creating this secondary piece which shows the process leading up to the project. And that's, you know, that's what I'm talking about here tonight is how do we tell that story about the process? Um, you know, once you have that high quality work, how do you talk about the process? So we're going to watch a clip about, um, it's actually from the PBS NewsHour. Um, about a project that came in the middle of three projects that were all tied together with uh, with the same theme. I'll tell you more after after the clip. By early December, students were on to the second leg of their journey, learning the science and social issues that would be at the heart of their invention. And the path teachers chose to take students there an eight-week-long interdisciplinary study of wind power. Science teacher Peter Hill. We started with a wind turbine. How do these things create electricity? And we took apart a motor. And we said, well, there's magnets and wires in here. How do magnets and wires interact to generate electricity? To make the learning go deeper, in tech ed class, students built working model wind turbines. The criteria for this project is the wind turbine that is stable and sturdy, it has to generate at least one volt of electricity. And the other piece is we want it to be creative, outrageous, ingenious, and inspirational. The politics of wind power was the subject in social studies. Emma Schwartz. The point is to find a place where it would be good or possible to have a wind turbine see what the environmental impacts might be if there's a bunch of huge like turbines in the area. You get those discussions around what is the sense of place and what is scenic beauty and, and how do you um, alleviate um, that, that issue. Let's see where you are. Next, Mark Jervis's students will argue for their turbine in a persuasive essay addressed to local officials. Okay. So this is, this is a, a middle project, the project of building a turbine was the middle project in um, an extended, I think, three-month um, set of projects. So the first project that's, that's featured earlier in this same clip is uh, students built robots to, um, to work and bring back certain things. Um, then they built working turbines, and then the third project, they built some sort of um, invention that would generate power and make people's lives better. So essentially ways to generate electricity. So this is a string of three projects. Uh, the clip we, we showed is the middle one. The school 
is in urban Portland, downtown. Um, Portland, Maine has a huge immigrant, uh, immigrant population. In the middle school, there are over 30 different languages spoken on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's great diversity of students um, coming from all sorts of, of places, many of whom um, are learning English as they go along. So this is, again, is not some high, um, you know, some preparatory school, some STEM preparatory school, or uh, an exclusive charter. This is a uh, urban public school. And the thing that's great about their projects um, is the way that they get students to believe in, e in themselves. Earlier in this same, um, in this same PBS NewsHour clip, um, and the whole thing's about a half hour long, they talk to some of the students who, when they first are told what they're going to be doing, are saying, I can't do that. I've never held a screwdriver before in my life. I have no idea how electricity is made. There's no way this is going to work. I'm going to fail. And you see during this documentary the various steps. They first worked on robots, robots that came with kits. And then they built their own turbines. And they studied in their English classes uh, the ver issues around power and um, and where to uh, uh, where to set up wind turbines and how to create persuasive arguments and the political issues and then in the last thing they they were studying how to create electricity and how to make it sustainable so again like the Pearl Cone um, project it involved a wide swath of the school uh, a whole bunch of different disciplines like the Pearl Cone video it started with kids who didn't believe they could do it and like the Pearl, like the Pearl Cone um, project they had ample time they had the relevance and the rigor to make it authentic and to engage them and it um, they had a public audience at the end that gave them that impetus to do high quality work. Now the difference is I know the school and I know that they had rubrics so in, in this case John they definitely were working from mm -hmm. what good quality um, work looks like on a rubric but I also know that they look at models and exemplars of other projects and this school has done perhaps more than any other school that I can think of uh, with video has created a culture of quality they really believe that even though they don't have a lot of specialized equipment they're not an entertainment magnet school like Pearl Cohn they believe that they can create great quality documentaries and they do based just using the the iMovie and the standard stuff that that's given to the school um, so again this is a story about a great quality uh, high quality projects and the messiness that leads up to that final product uh, Todd I have a quick question you mentioned yeah. that they create the documentaries. So I know one of the ways a school can build that culture of quality is to celebrate student work and display it. So I imagine there are just actual physical displays in the school as well. But are the documentaries, what's the audience? Is it for the parents or the community? Or who sees those documentaries? A great question. So they're, they're actually, um, a lot of them are posted online. And I'll share that link as, as well. Um, it's the King TV at Portland schools or so, something like that. Mm -hmm. but So they're posted on their website and the audiences are really threefold. One, students coming, you know, students coming to the school take a look at them to see what a good quality project looks like. So they're used as exemplars for incoming students. Second, um, our parents and community members especially the community members, some of their projects involve uh, work in the community 
and so these they're you know whether they're going out interviewing people or writing stories about local community members that that's a secondary audience and third because King Middle School is um, one of Expeditionary Learning's mentor schools their work is displayed to educators across the country as sort of inspiration for their own projects and that's that's part of why telling the story behind the great project is so important so that other educators can learn oh yeah it's it can be messy at other schools too mm -hmm. and here's how they broke it down cool. all right all right great John do you have any other questions for Todd uh, no that's all I can think of at the moment um, any questions out there from our uh, our viewers? Uh, I think we answered. It was about motivating students to do high quality work. Mm. Um, but I wonder, can you share with us where people can go find resources online? Oh well, uh, there are lots of examples of, of student work on uh, BIE's website, our video library, and a lot of those videos do tell the story of how they got there as well. There are a couple from King Middle School in that collection. All right. Well, thank you, Todd, and thank you, John, for hanging out tonight. Um, I'm just going to go through a little summary. Uh, we had our driving question, how can teachers and schools best tell the story behind a great project? And please read Todd's blog that we posted on the BIE blog earlier this week. Um, his blog was, let me get that, the work is the story, telling the story behind a great project. And it answers the driving question. One of the main points was showcasing your students' best work, but don't be afraid to show the process as well. Mm -hmm. And going back through the tips that John shared with us earlier, please remember to use rubrics and exemplars to help students understand the quality of work expected. Include effective formative assessment. Give students enough time to revise and polish their work. make the project authentic enough to motivate students and create a classroom and quality or in school culture of quality and please stay in touch with, with us here at BIE by following us on Twitter at BIE PBL you can also follow Todd on Twitter RT Felton and John L BIE that's John Larmer you can also follow me on Twitter at Liam BIE Please stay connected with us also on Google Plus at the Buck Institute for Education. And we also have a project-based learning community there that's very active where you can ask more questions either after or before a hangout or throughout the week. And um, we'll get somebody on there to share their best advice. And please join us next week as we start our new theme for the mon months of November and December which is Common Core and Project-Based Learning. And next week we'll have Sarah Hallerman, who's also from the Buck Institution, Institute for Education, talking with a special guest about the Common Core and PBL. So again, thanks, John, and thanks, Todd. Hey, thanks, Liam, for having me back. That was, uh, it's an enjoyable as always. All right. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.